The future of each of our nations, and indeed the world, depends on a free and open Indo-Pacific. We intend to build these submarines in Adelaide, Australia, in close cooperation with the United Kingdom and the United States. We have to strengthen uh, the EU's competitive position. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Energy crisis, gas prices continue to soar amid supply shortages. Later on in the program, we speak to the chief executive of the energy infrastructure operator, SNAP. Schultz braces for a Bundestag grilling while the front runner to become Germany's next chancellor will answer questions about the police raid on his finance ministry. And in an effort to counter China, the U.S., the U.K. and Australia announce a historic security pact. France underscores the need for European strategic autonomy. Now, first thing is first, we have a packed show for you because we have a lot of news. But to the markets, and you can see we're seeing a little bit of a lift in these stocks here in Europe, but gaining some 0.6%. Now, this is after we uh, saw six consecutive drops in the S&P over in the U.S. That was broken yesterday. We're back at uh, the records we saw in August. Uh, futures in the U.S. pretty much unchanged. The focus also a lot on crude oil. We'll have a big commodity check because there are concerns about the economy. There are, of course, concerns about what's happening in China with all of the regulatory crackdown. If we look at the individual indices, he's in Europe, but they tell us a better story of some of the technology stocks. For example, the UK technology and commodity rich gaining some 0.4%. Uh, the CAC 40, we'll spend a lot of time actually talking about France and the French markets because of the defense story. And then you can see the DAX gaining some 0.6%. The groups that are moving the most, I'm sure we're going to see travel and leisure, uh, chemicals and energy. Again, this is a reflation of course, a story to do with the economy. And then there's only one group but that's on the lower side, basic resources. Now, let's take a broader look at the markets. Eddie van der Valt from our Bloomberg Markets live team joins us. So, Eddie, thank you so much for joining us. And a big day for commodities. I know you've been watching commodities uh, a lot. What exactly is underpinning what we're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've just been astounded by the amount of niche commodity markets that are suddenly making their way into news, European electricity and, you know, natural gas markets and so on, things that we don't normally very heavily focus on. But, I mean, part of this story in Europe is there's, there's, there's two elements here. Number one, European natural gas uh, storage facilities are still very low. We're talking about 70%, whereas at this point in the year you were expecting them to have to be filled up very near the top so that when you go into winter, you can start drawing down. Now, some of that might be made by Nord Stream. We don't know. By Nord Stream 2, we don't know yet. But that's still coming. But the other problem is that the wind just hasn't blown. If, if, you, if you'll excuse me for, for a moment, this is sort of the, the perfect storm for European uh, energy prices, but in all the wrong places. We'd had storms in the U.S., um, which has affected natural gas or, or LNG flows, but the wind hasn't yeah. blown in Europe, and that's put pressure on electricity generation, which then meant we rely more on our nat gas supplies, yeah. which has pushed prices significantly higher across the board. I mean, Eddie, I, you know, I know this is a story, but I have to say, thinking that the UK doesn't have enough wind is something that, like, literally blows my mind. <laughs> uh, talk to me about crypto. So we also heard from Ray Dalio saying instead of cash, you should go into crypto. Yeah, really interesting. I mean, you know, Ray Dalio has a little bit of a problem here in that, you know, his um, risk parity strategy relies on the, the lower correlation between stocks and bonds. And in this uh, world of TINA, where there is no alternative, where uh, bond yields are already so low that, uh, that people are being pushed into stocks, there could very well be a case that, you know, as bonds sell off, stocks sell off too, if we see a tapering situation. And that makes a risk parity strategy and even the 60-40 strategy very risky. And so he's looking for diversification. And if there's nothing else that Bitcoin offers, it does offer diversification. So, Eddie, talk to me a little bit about some of the regulation that could affect stable coins and therefore could, I guess, infect the whole cryptocurrencies. I think this is the big risk to the cryptocurrency space at the moment. Regulation as a whole, probably good for cryptocurrencies because it means that there can be greater adoption. But at the moment, stablecoins is, is, is part of the backbone of the cryptocurrency space. And really what the regulators here are worried about is that a lot of these, uh, like Tether and others, Tether is a 62 billion uh, asset class. And basically what, what, invest, what, what, what the regulators are worried about is that a lot of what it holds is money market instruments. So if there's a run on Tether, you could 
see a sell-off in these money market instruments, which could, which could have a spill-off into the wider market. So there could be a feedback loop here, and that's why regulators are really worried about stable coins. Eddie, thank you so much. This is a good day for Eddie van der Waal. We talk about his two <laughs> passions, commodities and crypto from our markets live team. Now, natural gas, as Eddie was saying, power prices in Europe have continued their record-breaking run, and now it's really raising fears about supply security this winter season. In an interview with Bloomberg, the Chevron chief executive warned of higher energy prices and supply crunches. Reliability matters and affordability matters. And so costs, if costs go up, uh, consumers don't like that. And if reliability goes down, it creates real, real problems. And so it's one of the reasons that we have to be very thoughtful about changing the mix. And I think what, what we're seeing in Europe right now is uh, wind and solar are great, but if the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing, you need to have, you st people still need electricity. Mike Worth there, the chief executive of the world's second largest oil major, Chevron. Now let's get more from Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Berger. Danny, first of all, it's great to have you back. How long does it seem that this crunch will actually persist for? Yeah, the wind really being taken out of their sails. Another wind pun for you this morning. <laughs> well, We're on a roll. We are on a roll. The fundamentals, Francine, really do not look great. Eddie was talking about some of this. We also heard from Chevron there. Wind, of course, increasingly important for Europe and especially the UK. No wind means no power there. Also, gas stockpiles are very low and Europe is frankly running out of time to build up those stockpiles before it gets cold. So that's the fundamentals. Here are prices. Front month uh, Dutch futures uh, here. You can see that they reached a record high just yesterday more than quadrupling from the start of the year. We have seen that start to tail off today. Uh, still very elevated levels as you can see compared to history but just that decline today may suggest that at least for traders the worst could be over. So Danny, how are European governments actually reacting to this? I mean, we hear some of them saying, well, we need to subsidize. I mean, this is a huge political problem for them, especially yeah. if they're going through elections. Oh, absolutely, because this is a huge economic consequence if it hits the consumers, which these high prices are frightening. Of course, there are markets like the UK where those types of prices are very tightly regulated. But you look at what some of the other countries are doing. For example, Spain looking at limiting the windfall that these power utility companies can have, capping the bills. Italy, Mario Draghi saying that they are doing a whatever it takes approach using public funds. Of course, though, beyond governments, perhaps what investors are overlooking is the response mm -hmm. from central bank governors. And this is something that Ben Emmons over at Global Medley cites, saying that, look, inflation data in the UK and Europe, it's already showing the impact of power prices, and that may have implications for decisions from the Bank of England and the ECB, Francine. Danny, thanks so much. Dan Berger there with the very latest on some of these higher gas prices. Now, later in the program, we'll also be speaking to the head of one of Europe's biggest energy infrastructure companies. He He's now focused on hydrogen and renewables. Our conversation with SNAM's Marco Alvera. In this hour, you can send your questions to IB plus TV Go, or you can tweet me at Flacqua. Now, let's turn to the German election. The Social Democrat frontrunner, Olaf Scholz, will answer questions about last week's raid on the finance ministry in a special hearing in the Bundestag on Monday, less than a week before the national vote. Well, joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. Maria, first of all, I mean, it's kind of crazy that you have an election that's so important, and at the same time, 10 days before, you have someone who's just trying to answer these questions about what went happened with that raid on the finance ministry last week. And a week before the election, Francine. And, you know, to some extent, the idea here is that, you know, he needs to answer some very tough questions on what happened here. But the timing is very funny. And for the CDU, this is about saying, as a finance minister, you have not been a competent uh, operator. The problem is, Francine, that for many Germans, this sounds like desperation. The timing is coming before the election. The CDU continues with this red scare. It's a red, red, green government. And coming almost in a way that just looks very desperate to try to prop up right. government. But there was a raid, right? So there's there was a raid. A raid. So that's undeniable, and we need to get to the bottom of what happened exactly. Yeah, but the timing of that raid for many in Germany, and I was in Berlin up two days ago, many felt that this is something that was done to mess with all of Scholz. The timing of this is not because we want investigations or we want the answers to questions. This was about making all of Scholz look bad. Okay, I don't, yeah, I, that's quite a big allegation. <laughs> Maria, talk to us about defense. 
Yes, well, today we had uh, also in, uh, an overnight story coming from Australia and where we were sleeping. Uh, they cancelled a big contract from uh, the French from submarines, and they're very angry about this. And Francine, this story to me is fascinating, has so many different layers to it. One is, of course, the French have lost out the contract. It's going to the United States, it's going to the United Kingdom. The foreign minister today on the radio using language that to me is extraordinary was saying this is a stab in the back to the French, but also to Europe. So I would not be surprised if the European Union decides to maybe turn on the heat on the trade front again. Maria, thanks so much. Maria Tadeo there on those two important stories. Now, smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Later on in the program, we'll also discuss London Fashion Week, kicking off the autumn winter season with the chair of the British Fashion Council. Now, more than the season, it's really a talk about visas, Brexit and shortages. We'll also talk energy prices with the chief executive of one of Europe's biggest energy infrastructure companies, Snam's Marco Advera, joins us this hour. Again, if you have any questions for any of our guests, IB plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, coming up today, the ECB Governing Council member Oli Wren speaks on monetary policy and international economic situation at a press conference. We also get U.S. weekly jobless claims and retail sales, which would play into the U.S. inflation debate. And finally, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel meets the French President Emmanuel Macron. The two will discuss current issues in Afghanistan and Europe. Now, stocks rising in Europe, U.S. futures steady after the S&P 500 posted the biggest jump since August overnight. Energy shares rising as surging costs remain in focus. Now let's also look at Asia shares falling there. Of course, it's all about the debt crisis at China Evergrande hurting sentiment, intensifying concern over the impact of a default by Evergrande is actually rippling through the nation's financial markets. Now joining us to talk about all of this is Amundi's Global Head of Research, Monica Defend, to talk all things markets. Well, Monica, as always, thank you so much for joining us. So I don't know whether the markets for the moment have parked the inflation debate because of the CPI number we had this week <laughs> and are worried more about China and valuation, or whether actually inflation is still the number one concern dictating what central banks do that's mispriced in the markets. Thank you, Francine. I think that over August, uh, the market switched from the narrative of uh, too much inflation to the narrative of not too much, not enough growth. And this is what uh, has been uh, dominating global global markets. On inflation in particular, uh, the number in the, in the U.S. was uh, in line with our expectation, plateauing. And the good news is that uh, this is going to a uh, certain extent weaken the pressure on the, on the Federal Reserve. Uh, the, the market today uh, will be looking at the retail sales because uh, really the growth uh, concern are material. We do expect the growth to, to moderate after uh, the, the bounce back, uh, a moderation uh, is, uh, is on the line. The, the two, uh, higher inflation and uh, lower growth uh, can be the, the challenges uh, in, the, in the medium term. Monica, give me a sense then of what you think could be mispriced. So when you look at your research, are there things that the market misunderstand that you have to spend a bit more time on? Is it China or, or is it actually, you know, something else like consumer behavior in an inflationary environment? I think that the interest rates uh, still remain uh, the, the conundrum because uh, we, we know that uh, interest rates have been moving far away from the traditional inflation uh, growth pattern and they've been biased by the influence of the liquidity flash uh, that the central banks have been uh, injecting. So this is where uh, I see most of our concern. When it goes to, to China, uh, a big transition uh, is, uh, is in place uh, towards this uh, modern uh, socialist society with the idea of having in the short term uh, growth that is uh, more uh, sustainable and distributed in terms of wealth uh, to, to people at a time where they do not want any uh, turmoil in the financial market. So the, the situation is quite complicated in uh, into China. They continue with the regulation. This will continue. So we remain constructive of China. 
but on those sectors that are more insulated for, uh, from the regulation. And when it goes to the latest news on the market, we think this is part of the game where the government, right. the government has uh, to play between uh, default or intervention. So so if you look at COVID fears, and I guess the risks of variations, mutants, or booster shots not doing their work, what is priced in the markets right now? The market is uh, pricing uh, a kind of uh, Goldilocks to, to come, still uh, growth and inflation plateauing. This is what uh, the market is uh, currently pricing. We are uh, a bit more cautious on that, meaning yeah. that in terms of overall equity exposure, we are neutral, preferring uh, the relative space to temper the risk budget of the portfolio. Um, Monica, give me a sense of how investors should play China. So you call this, you know, they're trying to build a modern socialist country. At what point should we worry that what they're trying to do in China could actually hurt global growth? Well, the, the, the global growth spillover uh, is something that we really have uh, have to look. But uh, after the pandemic, we have seen uh, this uh, progressive uh, deglobalization and look for self-independency, like uh, in, in Europe. This is one of the clear strategy that state members uh, have in place. This might insulate uh, some of the spillover from uh, Chinese uh, slowdown. In terms of China, uh, they have um, a bond market that uh, is offering a uh, nice, uh, nice carry uh, when you go to the IG uh, emission, for, for example, while on the equity space, being in the biotech, uh, clean energy sectors uh, might be a good idea. Um, Monica, I don't know whether you know, you're into crypto or you're looking at gold right now, but is there an outlier call that you're spending more time thinking about, again, your global research? Definitely. Uh, we cannot uh, ignore the, the crypto wave, though uh, we, we remain uh, skeptical. And if I have to uh, think to the allocation for um, uh, our reference portfolio on, the, on an institutional client, I would not consider, we are not considering crypto, but we are looking at digital. While gold, definitely, uh, a little brick of gold in, uh, in our portfolios is, is something uh, that is uh, dominating the allocation uh, in, in the long term. We have been long gold uh, since, since a while. It, it goes uh, when um, growth uh, might disappoint, when inflation uh, might be an issue. So a little bit of gold uh, is uh, always worth having. Monica, thank you so much as always. Amundi's head of global research, Monica Defend, joining us today on the markets. Now, smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Later on in the program, we talk London Fashion Week and we talk luxury spending, especially as the Chinese are not in the UK at the moment. It kicks off with the autumn winter season. We'll be talking to the chair of the British Fashion Council, Stephanie Fer. Now, we'll also discuss energy prices with the chief executive of one of Europe's biggest energy infrastructure companies. SNAM's Marco Alvera joins us shortly. If you have any questions for any of our guests, IB Plus TV Go, or you just tweet me at Flacqua or tweet at Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg. In order to make the best team win, we need to have a level playing field on the rules and regulations on a global scale. That's really important on the whole climate matter. The carbon footprint doesn't only happen within the four walls of a car manufacturer. Right? It actually, you know, creates it's created across the supply chain, and this is why. And this is also a unique opportunity for you to create strong B2B platforms. We should go in the direction to um, enable our industry to develop the solutions um, that enable uh, countries worldwide to become climate neutral. That should be the agenda. At the end of the day, this way is not all about risk, but it could be an opportunity for Germany and for Europe. And therefore, whenever we talk about environment, let's also talk about the S part, because the one does not go without the other. Well, those were some of the highlights from yesterday's Germany election special, the chief executive briefing. It would also replay on Bloomberg TV this Sunday at 4 p.m. I also urge everyone, and I'll push it on social media, to go and read a fantastic quick take 
to try and understand why Angela Merkel's exit from Germany also matters for Europe and the rest of the world. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Hi, Francine. Australia is joining a new Indo-Pacific security pact with the US and the UK that could pave the way for it to acquire nuclear-powered submarines. Leaders of the three nations announced the agreement, which will also increase cooperation on cybersecurity in a virtual meeting. France said the move halts a 2016 deal with shipbuilder Naval Group for up to 12 submarines for Australia. The Asian nation will now build the equipment itself. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has overhauled his cabinet, promoting a woman as the UK's first Conservative female foreign secretary. Brexit convert Liz Truss replaces Dominic Raab, who was criticised for his handling of the Afghanistan withdrawal. The reshuffle is expected to continue over the coming days as Johnson gets to grips with falling poll numbers and the continuing challenge of the pandemic. A third dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine can dramatically reduce rates of COVID-related illness in people 60 and older. That's according to data from a short-term study in Israel. Confirmed infection rates were 11 times lower in the booster group compared with the group that got the two standard doses. Pfizer is expected to flag the data at a meeting with the US FDA on Friday. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Francine. Thank you so much, Laura Wright. Coming up next, we talk about renewables, the energy crisis and hydrogen. We speak to the SNAM chief executive. This is Bloomberg. Energy crisis, gas prices continue to soar amid supply shortages. Later on in the program, we speak to the chief executive of energy infrastructure operator, SNAP. Schultz braces for a Bundestag grilling while the front runner to become Germany's next chancellor will answer questions about the police raid on his finance ministry. And in an effort to counter China, the US, the UK and Australia announce a historic security pact, while France, not too happy about it, underscoring the need for a European strategic autonomy. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, natural gas and energy prices, you should know it by now, in Europe have continued their record-breaking run. And that's now raising fears about supply security this winter season. Let's get more from our Danny Berger. Danny, I mean, it, it has been actually pretty shocking following the price. What exactly is going on? Yeah, record after record. It has a lot to do with both low wind output as well as gas inventories. These are really two, the two key components when we're talking about energy in Europe. Without those, as I said, we've seen prices start to skyrocket. So this is what it looks like in terms of Dutch front end energy futures. This is natural gas. And you can see that just yesterday they hit an all-time high. This is quadruple of what it was to start the year. Yes, it's eased off somewhat, but in the grand scheme of things, these prices are still extremely elevated. And it's really the case throughout the UK and all of Europe as well. Let me show you what German prices look like compared to the average. And Europe is really running out of time to stockpile before it starts to get cold. We've seen governments throughout Europe respond to this, wanting to ease the burden that consumers might face because of the potential economic implications. As Goldman says, the industry might face blackouts, Francine. Danny, thanks so much. Our Danny Berger there with the very latest on some of these shocks to the system. Well, joining us to discuss energy prices is Marco Alvera. He is chief executive of SNAM, one of Europe's largest energy infrastructure companies, also author of the new book on a hydrogen revolution, a blueprint for the future of clean energy. So, Marco, thank you so much thank for you, joining Francine. us. Look, you came because there's this book. It's a great book, and I want to talk about renewables. But actually, there's so much news in terms of gas prices, yeah. and you're really an energy expert. You also gave me, I think it's twice in the last four years, which I try and study, <laughs> right, a pipeline. So this is, like, energy has to come in and out of Europe. If the UK, it depends on where it comes from. I mean, why is it so difficult to keep these gas prices under control right now? Well, what happened is really a perfect storm. We've been used to regional gas prices. So the U.S. had its own prices, Asia had its prices, and Europe had its own prices. With the uh, rise of LNG and the decline of U.K. production and Dutch production, Europe is now fully reliant on LNG. So the price in Europe is determined essentially by what happens in China. People have underestimated the rise of Chinese demand. 
China has stopped using coal for cooking, for example. It's made it mandatory to use right. gas. So big coal to, to gas switch in China is driving up demand. A lot of maintenance during COVID and prices have just shot up. But, Marco, how could we have let this happen? I remember five, six years ago speaking to you about this, that our number one concern as Europe was supplying energy. Supply, you know, energy security was number one on the list. Is there anything that governments can do now to reverse that? Now, government needs to invest in storage. We have a lot of oil storage that we don't really use, nor we really need. Uh, we don't have in many countries storage. So the key issue for this winter is that we're not able to fill up the storages fully. That's the key determinant. That's where governments can intervene to regulate storage, to make it mandatory for people to fill up storage. Some countries like Italy, where we have obligations to fill up storage, storage tanks are full which is good. I mean, this is a huge political problem, right? And here in the UK, so the UK is hosting Glasgow COP26, and at the same time, they've had to fire up the coal plants to try and make up for the shortage also because of lack of wind. I mean, what does it mean for renewables? So renewable is a medium to longer term play. Uh, the sh shortage, I think, is, is, is really going to just affect this winter because supply will build up. Uh, renewables are much cheaper than the prices we've just seen uh, a second ago. So the bottom line is solar energy in a sunny place costs 10 where gas today costs 70 euros per megawatt hour. So medium long term renewables will address and fix all this because they are predictable when it comes to sun and they're manageable when it comes to wind. But for now, we need to, to, to worry about this winter. Hopefully it's not going to be too cold. If it is cold, we're going to see demand adjust. Some people are already shutting down production. If you're making fertilizers, yeah. for example, the prices are already too high. So I'm not worried about blackouts, but I'm worried about uh, the competitiveness of certain sectors that are really dependent on energy prices to, to, to succeed. You know, talk about renewables and hydrogen, which is what your, your you know, brilliant book is about. And it just makes you smarter on something that not a lot of people trust or understand, to, to be honest. It, what price level do we need? So does it need to be cheaper than oil or does it need to be cheaper than coal to have wider adoption? This is a key point. Our pledge, we're working with seven companies, we're bringing it to the G20 and to COP26 in Milan and in Glasgow, is to make green hydrogen made from solar or wind energy cheaper than oil in five years time and that will really address a lot of a lot of the pricing issues around the world because that will act as a ceiling for for pricing so that's two dollars a kilo 50 euros a megawatt hour and that by the way is cheaper than oil today in 10 years time the department of energy in the u.s says we can get to one dollar a kilo or 25 dollars a megawatt hour which is cheaper than coal so green hydrogen cheaper than coal is the way to get china and india off new coal plants. I have viewer questions, which I want to get to in a second, but I also want to ask you, Marco, about some of the components that maybe we're missing. So if you speak to the Glencores of this world, if you speak to a lot of the commodity producers, they say, look, if you're going to change into renewables, including hydrogen, you need some of the rare earth. You need some of the things that actually are very difficult to find. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a shortage of that that will slow the transition to green? The shortage will, will slow certain technologies. We're one of the leaders investing in electrolyzer technology. It's what you need to split up water right. and create hydrogen. And the challenge is to make these, these plants with cheaper material, with different material. There's many technological alternatives out there. So I wouldn't put all the eggs in one basket and say there's a massive uh, rare earth crisis. There's going to be specific right. crises for lithium, for specific products. Generally speaking, I think technology is going to succeed and we're going to see costs coming down much faster than people expect. Uh, Mark, the other big question is, of course, the, you know, the Joe Biden infrastructure plan. What does that mean for hydrogen? And there's not a real difference between blue hydrogen, which, you know, is not as good as the green hydrogen because the blue use fossil fuels. I mean, how do you work around that? So blue is a transition issue. We need to make blue uh, almost carbon free. So you can make dirty blue. We need to make clean blue. Right. The infrastructure is there. The map you showed is a gas pipeline. Yeah. We can use exactly that same infrastructure to move hydrogen around. So you have pipes there going into North Africa. We can produce a lot of a lot, a lot of pipes. A lot of a pipes. Lot of so I say the North Sea is like the Disneyland of hydrogen. Look yeah. at all those pipes up there in the North Sea. A lot of wind, a lot of pipes, a lot of cheap hydrogen coming into Scotland, yeah. coming into the UK. But what needs to happen for it to turn into hydrogen? So Not much. political support. Yeah, but costs are coming down fast enough that the amount of political subsidy, political support is little. So we have to turn it on its head. The energy transition is not about costs and, and, and taxes. It's about creating the biggest yeah. business opportunity we've seen. This is trillions of dollars of infrastructure that's going to deliver cheaper and more reliable energy yeah. than we have today. Okay, I love it when viewers actually get excited about our interviews as much as I do. And uh, thank you, Mr. or Ms. Viewer, writing in. This is just the beginning of fossil fuel companies cutting investments. Marco, what would happen to energy security and fuel prices as the transition moves forward and investments continue to lag? 
it's going to be boom and bust. We've seen this before. When investments stop and demand rises, like, like we're seeing on these charts this morning, prices just skyrocket. So we need investments to continue for the transition. But again, the wind and solar costs are coming down so fast that we need to really continue to invest for another four or five years in conventional infrastructure. And then in five years, we'll deliver hydrogen cheaper than oil. Do you remember, and I think you were talking about it, do you remember when you were skeptical about hydrogen and suddenly thought, actually, no, there's something there? I was so skeptical because I was skeptical that solar costs would come down so fast. So we were living in a world where solar energy was at $1,000 a megawatt hour and gas was at 20. Now we have gas at 60 and solar at 10. So it's really a paradigm sh change that's really going to accelerate a lot of this transition. Uh, Marco, we also had this report of, you know, if you're a European government, if you're an Angela Merkel, or maybe her successor, but you know, if you're Emmanuel Macron or Mario Draghi, you're thinking, right, my energy prices are going through the roof. I, I need to make sure that people can still afford their living goods. I need to give subsidies or something like that. Does that impact actually the transition to renewables? Because suddenly, you know, it, the, the price could fall, or as a consumer, the price, my price could fall of what I pay. Yeah, so ultimately prices are cheaper, so it will help energy poverty. But we need to address energy poverty head on. We can't have a solution to fix it all. We need to figure out those families that are in greater need and those companies that are in greater need and have very focused incentives for them. Energy poverty means two things. Either you're not heating your home enough because you can't afford it, yeah. or you're spending way too much money on heating and you're suffering uh, from, from shortages elsewhere. So we need to support the, the weaker families and the weaker companies as opposed to trying to figure out fix all measures because there's nothing governments can do when oil is at 100 or was at 150 or gas is at 70. It's just too big for taxes to kind of fix it for everyone. Okay, Marco, thank you so much. Uh, thank Marco Alvira there, Chief Executive of SNAM, came with a book but also with a map. But his book, The Hydrogen Revolution, it's a good read. It just makes you smarter on stuff that not a lot of people know about. Now, coming up, we talk about luxury and fashion making a partial return to its former physical glory. The concern, of course, is labor shortage. It's not only about not having enough tourists from China coming in the UK, but it's also about taxes, bringing products and goods in and out of the country. Uh, we'll talk about the fashion industry as models begin showcasing the best in British design on the catwalks from tomorrow. We'll be speaking to the chair of the British Fashion Council next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francie Lacroix here in London. Now, the world's fashionistas are descending on the UK capital for London Fashion Week, which opens tomorrow. It's an opportunity for top established designers to showcase their work alongside some of the very best emerging British talents. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Stephanie Fer, the chair of the British Fashion Council. Stephanie, as always, so, so good to speak to you. I know it's like a crazy busy week for you. The focus, of course, is on the business of fashion. How has the pandemic changed the way you look at what needs to be done, whether it's sustainability or circularity or even the impact of Brexit? Good morning, Francine. Thank you. Yes, it is a busy week and we're looking forward to Fashion Week coming back, we have over 130 designers and it is a hybrid model. What the last 18 months have shown is that actually there is a value in having a very strong digital platform, which we, of course, at the BFC, British Fashion Council, were the first to pivot uh, to digital. So it's wonderful. It's a platform um, for business, but also a very important uh, cultural show of the strength of the UK economy. But of course, some of the challenges that you've mentioned are, are not helping us. So I think we have short and medium term challenges, which we've discussed before, the challenges around COVID and what will happen when the furlough program um, is, is um, sunset. And then, of course, uh, challenges around Brexit. And those we've mentioned before, it's about import and export and all of the customs paperwork required. But it's also, and we're seeing it, keenly skills shortages in terms of yeah. highly skilled professions. And this is um, the fashion industry is so multifaceted. It's not just about models or image makers. It's about manufacturers, textile, seamstresses. So these are some of the shorter term challenges. Stephanie, a lot of the focus, and I know you were you know, leading the charge on this, is on sustainability, is on circularity, and actually what the, the fashion world, the luxury world can do to maybe minimize 
and help the green transition. What are we talking about in terms of, you know, the steps that will really be taken? Like, is it too soon to say how it will transform the fashion world? No, I think it, it really is important. And I think on the eve of COP26, this is absolutely a time to shine the light on uh, the contribution to the fashion industry, not only from a negative perspective, we contribute uh, four to five percent um, in greenhouse gas emissions, but also the opportunity that if we fix it, we can really move the needle um, in our race to net zero and the government's goals to their 2030 and 2050 net zero goals. So in practice, what does that mean? Um, I'm delighted that this week we're launching our circular fashion ecosystem report, which was one of the first projects that we've launched as part of our um, Institute of Positive Fashion. And this is really at looking at a blueprint um, for a circular fashion economy in the UK, because ultimately the only way to fix this is to move from a linear um, fashion economy where you essentially buy something and then there's no real end of life to a circular one where we're being smart about the fabrics we use, we reuse it, we minimize waste, we minimize the waste in production and ultimately new business models get created. And what's very important is this is about bringing together stakeholders, um, the consumer, mm -hmm. industry, government, and to see this not as risk management but actually as an opportunity yeah. for growth. And that's what's encouraging. But, but Stephanie, how hard is it to go through this really, frankly, massive transition at a time where, you know, you've also or your members have had to adapt to sell online so because people didn't go into shop. The UK still suffering from the lack of outside tourists, especially from China. It, it is hard to go for this transition, which is why no company can do this alone and no individual business can do this alone. We've got our very large businesses, Burberry and Stella McCartney, for example, who are making great strides, but even they have to be able to share um, the knowledge and be able to benefit from an industrial transformation program that the government can encourage. So it is difficult, um, but ultimately we need that blueprint so that it becomes economically more viable to become a more sustainable business. And interestingly, if you see some of the younger brands and emerging brands, they all have circularity built into their fashion model. They are seeing that the future from a consumer standpoint, but also for those who are following sort of the world of finance, money and impact investment is flowing into businesses that yeah. are, are future-proofing themselves. But Stephanie, how difficult is it, you know, for the moment for some of your designers and your, you know, luxury companies to transition also in the way we shop, you know, like not a lot of people still wear suits, not a lot of people have, um, you know, events in the evening. How, like, I don't know whether it's been that been the most difficult part for a lot of these designers or whether it was just all around closing shops and going to online. So I think um, it's the difference between has there been a drop in demand or has there been um, sort of a, a, a mix, a change in the way people shop. I think a bit of both. The good news is we think demand um, is recovering, um, but there's been a paradigm shift to online. So the difficulty that you're pointing at is probably the businesses that haven't really embraced the digital revolution. And there are still some um, and who haven't been able to connect directly with their consumers. But we are seeing that coming back. We're seeing physical events come back. We're seeing people wanting to shop for occasions. So that's incredibly helpful. And it is a resilient economy. And uh, a new ex Oxford economic study that's just uh, come out for across the retail, so it does, it does include um, beauty, states that actually we yeah. could surpass in terms of recovery and grow 20%, clearly from a lower base. Um, but it is important, actually, to think about that growth in the context of building back better. Stephanie, thanks so much. Stephanie Fair there, the chair of the British Fashion Council, joining us this morning. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Hi, Francine. Anti-government marches in El Salvador have been protesting government moves to consolidate power and against the adoption of Bitcoin as a legal tender. Several thousand people marched in the country's capital, San Salvador. Demonstrations were largely peaceful, though one group smashed windows and set fire to a Bitcoin ATM kiosk. European car sales slumped in August, dropping 18 percent, even against last year's pandemic depressed numbers. The European Automobile Manufacturers Association 
Aviation says total sales are now up just 13% for the year as output gets squeezed by the global chip shortage. The bosses of VW, Daimler and BMW have all warned the supply crunch will continue into next year. SpaceX has launched four civilians on a three-day orbital excursion that could herald a new era in human spaceflight. The launch, dubbed Inspiration 4, took off from Kennedy Space Center in Florida aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. It reached an orbiting height of more than 364 miles around three hours later. The passengers included a tech billionaire and three other U.S. citizens without specialized astronaut training. Francine, do you think you'd qualify for a mission? I mean, maybe if I, you know, I think if I was a billionaire, I would seriously think about going into space. Otherwise, doing the hard work that goes with it without, you know, the money to have my own private capsule. No, Laura, you? It doesn't look that comfortable, I must say, but I hope that their positions changed once they were in orbit. Yeah, and but what, what conversations you would have actually at dinner parties afterwards? Maybe it's worth just for that. You'd entertain all your friends for decades <laughs> to come. That's uh, your Bloomberg Business Flash with Laura Wright. Uh, thank you, Laura. Now, coming up. The new security pact between Australia, the UK and the US brings a rift with France. So we'll get into the issues next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, and I'm Francie Lackler here in London. Now, Australia is joining a new Indo Pacific security partnership with the US and the UK that will allow it to acquire nuclear powered submarines. It comes as China has been expanding its military presence. Now, the news also sparked a rift with France over supplying the vessels. Well, joining us now for more on all of this is Karine Cunant from Paris. Karine, great to speak to you. So, the French are furious really about the deal. Uh, talk us through their reasoning. Yes, technically, this contract was dubbed uh, five years ago the contract of the century, $66 billion for 12 nuclear submarines that were going to be built uh, in Normandy and the west of France uh, by this group called Naval Group. Thales, the French defense company, actually owns 35%. They had to issue a statement uh, this morning saying, don't worry, we are maintaining our financial targets despite the withdrawal of uh, Australia for this contract. The uh, foreign ministry Minister of France, Jean-Yves Le Drian, said he was very angry. Uh, there was trust betrayal uh, from Australia. And in fact, he was also angry at the U.S., calling Biden's declaration yesterday a brutal uh, and uh, saying it was like a, a stab in the back uh, for France. In fact, this contract was supposed to employ hundreds of French people, but also Australians, because it had suppliers in Australia. In fact, they just signed uh, a, a supply contract for one billion billion uh, dollar for Australia for this French contract. Yeah. So clearly, uh, this is a blow for uh, French diplomacy, the French industry, and underlines the needs for more autonomy of uh, the French and European defense industry, according uh, to uh, the government here. Karin, in 20 seconds, also Angela Merkel meeting Emmanuel Macron in Paris. Yeah, and she's lived through four different French presidents, 16 years at Chancellor, so clearly this is going to be uh, the last dinner at the Elysee Palace for Angela Merkel and perhaps after her departure, the shift to become the de facto European leader will go to Emmanuel Macron, that at least if he gets re-elected in seven months' time. Kaolin, thanks so much. Kaolin Kunan there uh, really speaking to the changing face of Europe but because of various elections, Germany and then France. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller joins me out of London. He's in London. Watch out, London. Uh, Kaylee Lines will be in New York. This is Bloomberg. slowly get to a point you get any type of disruption as you go into the autumn you know the potential for oil prices to explode to the upside is increasing because of um, the decarbonization that's, go that's going on you're not going to see a lot of extra new investment and think I think we're at the beginning of a, a multi decade potentially bull market in commodities what we're seeing in Europe right now is uh, wind and solar are great but if the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing you need to have 
you st people still need electricity. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. It's 10 a.m. here in London, 11 a.m. Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong this Thursday, September 16th. Our top stories today. Power play, Europe's energy crunch, has led to huge price jumps. It's forcing factories to shut down. Will Biden's economic agenda be put on hold? Will Congress may delay it by weeks or months? While Democratic Party progressive and moderate wings fight amongst themselves. And the fallout from the spread is spreading from Evergrande, while there's growing concern over what an Evergrande default would actually mean for the markets. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua with Matt Miller here in London. Kelly Lines, we're missing you here in London. You're still in New York. The market definitely focused on some of the positives, but at the same time, Kaylee, worrying about China. Yeah, I have to say, Francine, I'm feeling quite lonely on set here in New York. I'm very jealous that you and Matt <laughs> get to be together this morning. As for what the picture looked like in Asia, while things are positive, more so in Europe, it was a deeply negative session in Asia overnight. Red really all across the screen. Stocks down in Japan, South Korea, China, and the underperformance coming from Hong Kong. The Hang Seng Index actually re-entering a bear market. It is heading for its worst week since March. Now, of course, there's a couple stories at play there. On the one hand, you have the continued regulatory crackdown from China, this time on casino operators. And those stocks fell again in the session, down about 5.7% as a group. And of course, the other story we're watching, as Francine said, is China Evergrande. The situation seems to be deteriorating every single day. Two more rating downgrades today, a lot of concern about default, and that is spreading throughout the property sector. The Hang Seng property index down 3.4 percent overnight. Now, of course, there's another asset that is impacted by the property sector, and that is copper in that property development, very key for demand and concerns about that and a broader slowdown in China's economy weighing on copper futures this morning, down about 1.8 percent when it comes to LME pricing. Finally, I just wanted to point to the Japanese yen a little bit of a haven bid earlier, but right now it's essentially flat against the U.S. dollar. As for the picture here in the U.S., we actually saw a gain on the S&P 500 yesterday, the second time in eight days that that has happened. So we will see if we continue that today. Right now, it doesn't appear so. Futures have been fluctuating, but we're down about three points on S&P E-minis. Not a lot of movement in the bond market. We're up a basis point on the U.S. 10-year yield, sitting right around that 131 level. It is a broadly stronger dollar story this morning. And crude, I would note, was down earlier, but now up for a fifth day in a row. It's up more than 6% over the last five days, Matt. It's a supply side issue, but right now, WTI crude trading at 72.76 a barrel. Yeah, continue to watch commodities for sure. Okay. Also, in terms of equities here in Europe, we are seeing a ton of green on the screen. The FTSE MIB in Milan up more than 1%. The DAX and the CAC both up a little bit more than half a percent, eight tenths of percent gains on the CAC Courant and on the IBEX in Madrid. So across Europe, we do see gains in equity indexes. I would like to note uh, one equity in particular. Up in Ireland, you see that there's a 2% gain. Maybe you can't see it, but it's very bright up there. That's because Ryanair is such a heavy weighting, and Ryanair is boosting its forecast big time for carrying passengers um, in the coming years. In fact, by 2026, Ryanair sees 50% passenger growth from pre-pandemic levels, that's up from 33% previously, they expect to carry 225 million passengers in 2026. And this is driven not only by um, growth in demand, but also by growth in their 737 MAX fleet, their Boeing fleet. So this is really boosting airlines across the sector. It's going to be boosting airline uh, or plane makers, I should say, as well. Look for anything connected to airlines to rise today because of this Ryanair news. Here you can see the shares up more than 5.5% in Dublin. Francine? Yeah, and we're, of course, looking at energy prices. I mean, without a doubt, one of the stories of the day that's really concerning. I mean, I don't speak about fertilizers that often on TV, but, of course, this energy crunch. But when you do. But when I do, we go full on ahead. It's forced a major fertilizer to actually cut and shut down two U.K. plants. Now, look at what's ahead today. There's more U.S. data coming out. Traders will be watching for retail sales and weekly unemployment claims. Now, there will be an informal meeting of the EU Trade Policy Committee in Slovenia, one PM New York time. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel will also meet French President Emmanuel Macron for dinner in Paris. They're expected to discuss Afghanistan and European issues. Now we had this whole, you know, I came in and I was like, this is kind of a big deal just because, you know, Angela Merkel stepping down. 
on the 26th of September. Now, this not only changes the face of Germany, but also of Europe, but then you kind of wonder, you know, meeting with Macron, if it really has any any impact on foreign right. policy. Right, she's a lame duck chancellor, right. but I think she's still such a powerful figure in global mm -hmm. politics that it's still important to watch. And such a brain. Uh, and such a brain. She's a chemist, I believe. Her husband's a physicist, or maybe it's the other way around. I thought your uh, uh, Germany special was amazing yesterday. And I have to just say, I got so much feedback from clients, from friends of mine in Germany, just who watch the show. I mean, having Christian saving on a panel with Joe Kayser for, yeah. what was it? A, 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 an hour. An entire yeah. hour was just so cool. And I hope that we'll um, be able to use that throughout the rest of the week. I mean, going up fun. to the election, yeah. I, it, it's very cool. You know what? Although I like Kayser had his blazer on like a cape, almost like an I know, evil I Bond I villain. I love that. I really yeah. I quite loved it. And he was giving back, I have to say, to some of the other chief executives. What was interesting is that they all asked for a real concrete economic plan from whoever becomes the right. next Right. They chancellor. want a little bit of spending energy. They want a little bit of fiscal power the details. to help. details. Exactly. Now, natural gas and power prices in Europe have continued their record-breaking run, and now it's raising fears about supply security this winter season. In an interview with Bloomberg, the Chevron chief executive warned of high energy prices and supply crunches. Reliability matters and affordability matters. And so costs, if costs go up, uh, consumers don't like that. And if reliability goes down, it creates real, real problems. And so it's one of the reasons that we have to be very thoughtful about changing the mix. And I think what, what we're seeing in Europe right now is uh, wind and solar are great, but if the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing, you need to have, you st people still need electricity. Let's get more on all of this with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Danny, I mean, how much longer does this crunch persist and how much of a nightmare is it for companies? Oh, well, it's absolutely nightmares. You were talking about some of those fertilizer companies in the UK having to shut. Goldman warning that there could be more blackout for industry. And in general, the fundamentals of this picture don't look good. And that suggests that this could drag on for some time. You have low stockpiles when it comes to gas. You have wind inflow, just not really keeping up to where it usually is. And that means that prices have been skyrocketing. Let me show you what those look like. So Dutch front month futures for natural gas. They've moved up. They've quadrupled so far this year. And look, if you look to this side, it's come down ever so slightly, but still extremely elevated compared to historical prices. And we're not even in the winter yet. So the fear is, is that this could just continue to get worse. Yeah, and of course, for our listeners on London DAB Digital Radio, all you really need to know about that chart is it's a line that goes pretty much parabolically yes. upwards. So, Danny, let's talk about the response to this. How are European governments reacting? Well, in general, the response, be it from France, Greece, uh, Spain, has been to try to cap what consumers are paying because, of course, this can translate into a political issue if you have all of a sudden your voting base having to pay more. So if you're Spain, you're looking at putting taxes on windfall profit. If you're Italy, you're looking at using state funds uh, to help in, uh, pay some of the consumers back. The U.K., we haven't heard anything. But if you're an investor, perhaps what you're overlooking is not necessarily the government response, but the response from central banks. This is something Ben Emmons at Global Medley Advisors brings up, saying essentially that this is a big input into inflation. And we've already seen that impact showing through, and that might have implications for decisions by the BOE and the ECB, Kaylee. Yeah, a lot of talk about stagflation happening right now. Bloomberg's Danny Berger, thank you so much. Now let's head over to Washington, D.C. President Biden's agenda took a step forward yesterday with the approval of tax hikes to pay for it by the House Ways and Means Committee. However, the plan still risks getting delayed by weeks or even months in Congress as other issues are still unresolved amid Democratic rifts. Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now from Washington. So, Jack, we're making progress. Just how far away is the finish line? They're not very close to the finish line. Yes, they did move forward in the House on the tax measures uh, and some other key measures yesterday, and they have been inching forward through their markups. But for one, we saw that they couldn't initially get their prescription drug pricing measures out of the Energy and Commerce Committee because they had three moderate Democrats opposed to it. They later actually got that out of a different committee in Ways and Means because it's to the same jurisdiction. Uh, but the fact that they have had now, I count, four moderate Democrats at, at certain times voting against things in markups means it's a, a very difficult path forward in the House, and they still have to negotiate with the Senate. So you are going to see change 
changes to what is in the tax bill, some of the drug pricing measures. Uh, we're, we're really sort of still near the beginning of the process, and you should expect significant changes to a, a pretty wide variety of what's in these bills right now. Speaking of negotiations, Jack, the president is meeting with CEOs on vaccines. He wants them to mandate, I guess, either mandate the shot or require testing. The, the latter seems like a little bit of an easier sell. What's the story? Well, the, the alternative to companies with more than 100 employees is weekly testing requirements. Uh, they've got a little bit of time to implement that, but that obviously, it, you know, it may be an easier sell to people who are opposed to getting vaccinated, but setting up a, a required weekly testing regime that is a logistical challenge. So there has been pushback from conservatives on this. It's something to watch probably more in the courts if there are legal challenges to this going through OSHA rather than a congressional debate. Uh, but there there has been pushback on the right, and it is a, a pretty, a pretty significant requirement saying that larger companies would either need to require that vaccine or have a weekly testing regime put in place. Jack, thanks so much. Jack Fitzpatrick there of Bloomberg Government. Now, over to China, intensifying concern over the impact of China Evergrande Group defaulting, which is rippling through the nation's financial markets. Now, this comes after Evergrande's onshore unit actually halted bond trading after a domestic rating cut put it among the country's riskiest issuers. Now, let's get straight to Tom McKenzie, our China expert. Tom, we've been talking about this for quite mm -hmm. some time. It feels like now what it could be maybe systemic. Possibly. This is a pivot moment, I think. We've seen this in the last couple of days. Look, we talked about the news flow on this company. So the local bond unit that stopped trading, you highlighted that. The S&P downgrade, the fact that they've brought in advisors around a potential restructuring of this company. The government saying that they're going to miss interest payments. But what's happened in the last 24 hours to 48 hours is that the property sector more broadly has felt the pain on this. Double-digit losses for some of the biggest real estate companies in China. You're seeing it play out in the high-yield dollar bond space as well which property dominates, the real estate dominates in that high yield space, you're seeing yields at 18 month lows, up to 15, 16%. The banks are being hammered as well in China because of their links to the property sector, of course. So the broader question is, does this become more systemic? Some economists have said China is going too far, too fast in trying to de-risk its real estate sector, which don't forget accounts for between 20 to 30% of China's well, GDP. Well, they could be successful, right? I mean, I, I realize that this is sending ripples across the financial sector, but they do want to restructure. So is that a possibility, Tom? Could they have a successful restructuring and then move on? I, I still find it hard to believe that they're going to let this whole thing fall apart. But we saw with the case of Huarong, which was their big bad debt manager, asset manager. It was meant to take all these bad loans and sort them out. We saw with that in our own reporting right. that there was infighting between different ministries. So the risk is there that China's officials and technocrats who are smart and well-read and on top of things are infighting and they could let this, let this one slip. I still think the base case is they manage this to some extent. The risks are there. And again, yeah. the question marks about if they're going too far uh, and too fast. And anyone who thinks that Evergrande is isolated, by the way, in terms of using wealth management products and yeah. doing some dodgy dealing, they're living in cloud cuckoo land. Potentially major ripple effects. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie land. for always cloud staying on top land? of so all British. the cuckoo land activity, Matt. <laughs> All right. All right. I just thought I love the it's phrase. Good. It's, it's so a good British. phrase. It's a great right? phrase. Yeah. It kind of encapsulates. All right. All we're the going to get back on track so now. Let's take a look at some stocks moving in free market trading here in the U.S. One mover to the upside is one of the newest public companies out there on holding. Of course, it's a running shoemaker backed by Roger Federer. It made its public debut yesterday, a 46 percent gain greeted very warmly by the public markets. And it looks like those gains will continue the stock up about 2.4 percent in today's session. Another stock moving to the upside is EA Sports. Yes, it is delaying the introduction of its game Battlefield 2042 until November 19th. But analysts say that's really not a surprise. Plus, the company reiterated its full year guidance. So that stock is up 2.2 percent to the downside, though. And this is something, of course, we've been following with Tom McKenzie and really all week long casino operators. Macau crackdown from Beijing. That is weighing for a third day on wind resorts. It's coming off its worst two days since March of 2020. The loss is continuing in early hours this morning. That stock down about two and a quarter percent, Francine. Kaylee, thank you. Now, coming up, we'll talk retail with Stacey Wilditz, president of SW Retail Advisors, and a deep dive on precious metals with the chief executive of Shibane Stillwater, Neil Froneman. We'll talk gold and we'll talk luxury. Matt Miller's going to love this. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Francine Lacroix here in London. Kaylee Lines is out in New York. I saw an amazing chart on the MLive blog today. And for those of you listening on London DAB Digital Radio, I'll just recommend get on your Bloombergs when you get to the office or when you get to your terminal back home if you have one uh, there. Check out MLIV Go for this chart. It goes all the way back to the year 2002, and it shows the U.S. Empire State Manufacturing uh, Survey its prices, basically inflation. It also shows uh, manufacturing delivery time. And it's amazing the breakout we've seen. So many people have said this inflation is not like the inflation we saw in the 70s and 80s. David Rubenstein was saying, if you think this is inflation, then you haven't lived. But it is serious <laughs> compared to the last 20 years. I mean, we're seeing 50% inflation in prices and a 40% rise in delivery time. So, um, Noor, it's a real problem. Noor Al Ali joins us from Bloomberg Markets Live from the M Live blog. And what do you see? What do you hear from clients in terms of the inflation that we're experiencing? Well, realistically, there are two camps, right? The first camp says, by the way, look at the energy crunch. We've, we've been seeing inflation and prices rise persistently throughout this year, and that's a concern. But you've got also Camp Fed that says, hey, no, it's transitory. It's absolutely fine. Even if the CPI print will come in a little bit higher than our 2% target, it's still <laughs> within range. I don't know what that range is, of course, because it's quite elevated. But here we are right now. I mean, I love the fact that Ray Dalio said, you know, if you haven't lived through inflation, you haven't lived. I felt like a, a very rich four-year-old when a 1,000 liras in Italy, it was like worth $50, like 50 cents or something like that. Um, Nora, how do we know if inflation is sticky? So if I buy my cappuccino double the price or 30% more than last year, does it readjust when supply chains go down? Well, look, I mean, that's really the question. That's according to the supplies of whether or not they choose to reduce their prices. And now I know a lot of the times now we're talking a lot more about stagfl stagflation and all of that stuff. Yes, yeah, stagflation. The mentions of stagflation have jumped. I saw that chart this morning as well. So more and more people are coming on our programs yeah. and saying stagflation is a real concern. And people freak out. Markets I, freak out. I wouldn't. I wouldn't freak out. I would, I'm not. I'm not too concerned right now. And I think my my Eddie colleague and I were talking a little bit earlier about that. I mean, look, a stagflation environment is is you know when inflation comes in pretty high, when employment is quite high, and then growth is kind of slowing down as well. But realistically, growth in the United States is quite high, even at, at the at the level that it is right now. Even if it comes down from that to the two three percent level, that's still quite high. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry about that so far. Realistically, I'm more worried about the energy crunch and gas prices right now in Europe. Yeah, especially if you're a company that has to, to rely on so that. There is you're... something you're worried about. Yes. Good. Okay. Yes. As long as you're worried about always. something. Always. I always say it's good to worry about 30% of the things, but not maybe 70%. Nora Alali there of Bloomberg Markets Live. Now, for more market analysis from Nora and her team, just go to MLIV Go on the Bloomberg Terminal. We'll have plenty more market reaction coming up. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua and Matt Miller in London. Now let's get the first word news and there's speculation about the future of Macau following China's decision to tighten its grip on the gambling hub. Beijing wants to appoint government representatives to supervise casino companies. It also wants to boost local shareholdings in the companies and require them to get approval before distributing dividends. Australia is joining a new Indo-Pacific security partnership with the U.S. and U.K. The agreement was unveiled by the leaders of the three countries in a virtual meeting. The partnership has France upset because it allows Australia to acquire nuclear-powered submarines. And in 2016, Australia had agreed to buy as many as a dozen subs from the French. And it may be a new era in human spaceflight. Elon Musk's SpaceX has launched four civilians on a three-day orbital excursion. The passengers in the Dragon Crew capsule include tech billionaire Jason Isaacman and a childhood cancer survivor. It has been reported that Isaacman is paying SpaceX $200 million for the flight. He's also donating $100 million to charity. So, Matt, I must admit, 8 p.m. when this launch happened is past my bedtime, and I know it was the middle of the night for you and Francine in London, but I watched the replay this morning, and it never ceases to amaze me when humans go up in space. Well, and you can watch it on Netflix, right? True. Because they're doing a documentary. I think it's so cool that this launch brings so many 
mega cap tech companies together because it's a SpaceX thing, so it's involved yep. uh, Tesla, obviously, plus you've okay. got Netflix. Yes? What will it take you to go to space? I would Apart go in an cash. instant. I would go in an I, instant. Okay, I want the experience. Like going up for like whatever, like one minute and a half. Not for a minute. No. I want to go into orbit. Right. I want to get out. onto the ISS. Meet, meet that Russian books. guy up there who's, you know, he's <laughs> been there for six months and not seen oh another human and he's got like six empty bottles of vodka floating yeah. around. That's what, I, that's what yeah. I want, the real like experience. Yes. Okay, well, like, I'll be you know, watching you guys from down. the ground. Okay. Kaylee's not coming. She's going to stay <laughs> here and watch Evergrande. Bloomberg, Bloomberg surveillance from space. The market, I mean, actually, the market wall from space, I'm sure we can get a Bloomberg terminal up there. Hmm. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, it would be very cool. Coming up, we'll talk retail sales ahead of today's data with Stacey Wilditz, the president and chief international store hunter at SW Retail Advisors. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. I'm Francine Lacroix with Matt Miller in London, Katie Lines in New York. Matt, so we talk about the markets. So we saw the S&P 500 after six days of going down straight yesterday, finally going back to levels we saw in August. And then that uh, Goldman Sachs headline about the Bank of England, they are expecting interest rates to go at 1% by 2022. We also saw the similar move by Bank of America. This is inflation, and inflation in the UK is probably higher than anywhere else, also because of Brexit. Yeah, Brexit really doesn't help. <laughs> And you've got not only the shipping costs and the labor shortage, but now you've got energy prices that are off the hook. So um, it's really driving prices up around here. And yeah, Goldman Sachs expects the BOE to hike rates in May of 2022. Um, the BOE is going to bring its bank rate to 1% by the fourth quarter of 2023, according to Goldman Sachs. So I don't know if that's their terminal rate forecast, but back up to 1%, which in today's it's world seems like a it's lot. A lot. Yeah. It's a lot, especially when, you know, you are where you are with mortgages right now. Now, Kaylee, um, Matt mentioned the energy story. How's it all playing out in the markets? Well, definitely in terms of natural gas prices, we've seen that play out. But the broader markets in Europe really don't seem that concerned and that the stock 600 is actually higher right now by about three quarters of 1%. The only two sectors not in the green are utilities, so that may tell you something right there, and basic resources. I'll have more on that in just a second. When it comes to S&P 500 futures, as Francine said, we did have our second update in eight days yesterday. Right now, though, it doesn't look like those gains will hold. Not a lot of movement in the futures market. We're down, though, by about a tenth of a percent on S&P 500 futures. In the bond market, yields are ticking higher. We're up the better part of two basis points right now on the U.S. 10-year yield, sitting right around 131. And then, of course, I talked about how basic resources in Europe is down. That is an industrial metal story largely. A lot of this has to do with concerns about growth and property development in China. But copper is under pressure today. Futures down about 1.7%. And that move lower in copper is reading through to some equities here in pre-market trading in the U.S., one of them being Freeport McMurray and the materials company. It's down 1.6%. And then as we've been discussing all program and really all week, the casino crackdown in Macau uh, on the part of Beijing continuing to weigh on U.S. casino operators that also operate in Macau. Wynn and Las Vegas stands each down about two and three quarters of a percent at the moment. And then I just wanted to mention Beyond Meat as well, getting downgraded at Piper Sandler with a $19 price target. That would be about 14% downside to yesterday's close. Right now, the stock is down about 2.5% in pre-market trading, uh, and it is trading at $108, Francine. Now, investors are waiting U.S. retail sales coming out a little bit later. Today, joining us now is Stacey Valditz, SW Retail Advisors President. Uh, Stacey, thank you for joining us. So how exactly has consumer behavior changed? Are we spending less frequently but shopping more, or are we just shopping online? So what we're seeing is that the consumer is consolidating their trip. So when they go to the stores, they're buying a lot more. And they're also buying full price because there's no inventory out there and there's nothing on sale. The other thing that we're hearing is that back to school shopping started a little bit later this year, as maybe parents are a little cautious. Are we really going back to school? But again, I think the big theme going into holiday is inventory shortages, and by the way, not just in Vietnam, we have a bunch of log jams here in the UK as well. So you're going to see operating margins at peak and consumers clamoring for inventory. Stacey, what's an international store hunter? 
<laughs> I heard you say that in the break. So it means that I travel all over the world full time. I'm in stores and I never sleep and I'm always jet lagged. That's what it means. So are you still <laughs> even even during the pandemic? Have you continued to travel around and, and uh, check out international stores? I, I have where where I've been allowed to. Um, so, yes, and I've been very actively traveling um, recently. And uh, certainly, you know, one of the things I picked up recently in the UK was that still Brexit, um, a lot of the uh, particularly footwear guys are still having problems getting their inventory in here. So some mm. of the fall stuff is running weeks late. That is not helpful when inventory is already tight. Well, let's kind of talk about inventories and supply chain issues. We saw Nike getting downgraded at BTIG earlier this week, not because of anything having to do with demand. It's all about supply and factory closures in Vietnam. How how intense are supply chain issues for retailers right now? They're very intense, but you know what? This is not a new story. I'm positive on Nike. I mean, we've known about the supply chain issues for a while now. So I think when certainly when you look at Nike and half of their footwear is coming out of Vietnam and Vietnam is shut, that's a major problem. And they're doing their best to shift it elsewhere. However, long term, if you think about all these brands now that are crunched for inventory, what they're doing is they're selling full price. They're training the consumer to mm -hmm. pay full price and not expect discounts. Okay, yeah, so that's it's a really interesting point, Stacey, because obviously higher input costs, they then try and pass those on. But is there any sign that consumers are getting less tolerant for those price increases? Not yet. They, they aren't. And I think they're, they're not expecting those kind of Black Friday promotions, hmm. the ones that we've had in the past. And last year, we didn't have them either. So last year, trained the consumer not to expect. Stacey, how much more are we going to spend online? So if you look at, you know, for example, some of the penetration of the grocery stores or actually just stores in general in the UK, it's still only 30 percent. Do we get to 60 percent in three, four years? I think we could be at 50 percent. And of course, it depends on the category. So apparel is already 50 plus percent. Um, you know, Inditex yesterday reported and they're talking about 25 percent, a quarter of their business online. A few years ago, that was half. So it's really accelerating, depends on the category. You look at other things like home furnishings, you know, Williams-Sonoma, 70% of their business is online. So we're going to 50% pretty quickly. Wow. Hmm. All right, Stacey, thank you so much, Stacey Vidlitz there, SW Retail Advisors President. I mean, I was trying to think what I don't buy online, Miller, and I'm probably not the benchmark, but is there anything that you only buy in store? Uh, motorcycles. <laughs> I will only, but I do all my shopping online first, and then, then I'll do a target. test ride, and then I'll go to the dealer. There you go. But no, you're right. I mean, I, we're buying more and more stuff online. Groceries, which I previously would never have bought online, now I'm only exactly. buying online. Yeah. And there are things, you know, like toothpaste and toilet paper that are just like Definitely on subscription online. Yeah. at Amazon. So I mean, yeah, the only right. thing that holds me back is something that I could return. I'm just too lazy to return. So that's the only time yeah, where I'm if I'm not sure... Time. I'd, I'd go in brick and mortar. Now, coming up, come on to check. We speak with Noel, or Neil Froneman, rather, chief executive of Shibani Stillwater, a precious metal mining company. I'm sure I butchered the name, so we'll get the right pronunciation as well. Sabanye. Sabanye. <laughs> That's Close next. Enough. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Richard Thaler, Chicago Booth School Professor of Economics and Nobel Laureate. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Francine Lacroix in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, we had some pretty shocking car sales news in Europe this morning. To the downside, new registrations across Europe fell 18 percent from the same time last year. For those uh, listeners on London DAB, we're looking at a chart that goes back to 2020, 2011, I should say, but it's really just um, the month of August that's important here compared to the same month in 2020. A big drop and um, if you look at the full year, we've still seen growth over um, the horrible, terrible, no good pandemic year. But that growth has really been slashed. In fact, at the mid year, we were up uh, about 50 percent compared to last year. And now we're only up 
about um, 33 percent. So it's it's really come down as um, the chip shortage has impacted the production of cars and the impact of the chip shortage on the production of cars then also affects the demand for precious metals like platinum and palladium, which are used um, to make catalytic converters. You don't need as much of that stuff if you can't produce as many cars because of the chip shortage. Joining us now to talk about precious metals is Neil Froneman, the CEO of precious metal miner Sabanye Stillwater. Neil, thanks very much for joining us. Um, how do you see the impact of the chip shortage affecting the precious metals space? Um, yeah, good morning, Matt. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the disruption that has been caused by the pandemic, um, you're now starting to see play out in, in uh, things like chip shortages, there's other um, supply chain issues, um, and it's not a demand problem, this is a supply problem of components that go into cars. So we expected a volatile, um, let's say normalization period. Um, before things get back into balance. And you're seeing it play out now. It is certainly not a, a demand problem. It's rather a shortage of supply. Demand for the mm. for vehicles is as high as it's ever been. And in fact, it's uh, right. reflected in, in second-hand car prices and, and so on. Of so course. We, 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 yeah, we have expected this and we've planned for it and it'll probably continue into early 2022. As supply chain, well, Neil. Normal. Let me let me ask you, as we as we the, the demand is high, of course, but producers, a lot of them, at least they're telling us that they're switching over to electrification, to eat to, to EVs, and what I wonder is, if you no longer need a catalytic converter, but you still need a ton of silver for your electric vehicle motor, do you see a shift in the demand for precious metals? Um, we see a transition, Matt, but this this um, transition to electric powertrains is going to take a long time, probably five to ten years before you really start seeing the, um, the overall impact. And I want to point out that um, electric vehicles or electric powertrains are not only driven by batteries, they are also driven by fuel cells, which also use right. some of these uh, precious metals. Um, the other thing I want to say is there's, there's, there's good history that says when a new technology replaces an old technology, everyone always overestimates the, the impact of the new technology. In other words, the old technology right. also improves at the same time. Um, so, so this shift is, is going to happen. Don't get me wrong. It's going to happen and it needs to happen. It's the right thing, but it's not really going to have a significant impact on precious metals because there's a transition to the hydrogen right. economy as well. But Neil, you know, at the same time, I keep on hearing from you know some of the rare earth producers and some of the miners that there's going to be a shortage of some of these critical components used or some of these critical metals used for components and chips and, for example, hydrogen, some of the electro catalyzers that will you know come at the forefront in five years. So is this are we under investing in this space? Absolutely. You're going to see a shortage of what we call green energy metals um, across the entire landscape. And, uh, and that's why we feel as a company, we're in such a good position. Whether you talk lithium, whether you talk platinum, um, iridium, any of those metals, the only one that is really under risk in the longer term is perhaps palladium, but all the rest have very good fundamentals. Neil, what's the, the, the most concerning thing about the sh chip shortage right now? How much does it actually shift prices in the short term, six months, in the longer term, and in between? Yeah, I, I think that uh, what, what, you, what we will see and experience is, is in a lot of inflation because there's no doubt that the, the chip suppliers are going to use this to push prices like any commodity does under you know, a deficit scenario. Um, that may impact the demand for cars. Uh, it could even even create competitive technologies, uh, not technologies that are going to affect us. But uh, in in the longer term, I also think there's some good that's going to come out of it. I think um, the regionalization of supply chains, um, mm -hmm. which the pandemic has highlighted, and hence you would have seen a, an announcement we made this morning, 
of investing in a lithium project in the US for US uh, battery manufacturers. So regionalization is going to happen to make sure there's security of supply as well. But let's talk about what it actually means for prices for platinum group metals. What is your expectation on the trajectory of prices, given that they have softened a bit in recent weeks? Yes, yeah, so, so I've always maintained that um, something like rhodium should be at about $10,000 an ounce. It's happened to come down to that now. I think palladium is stable for the next four or five years, probably at about two, $2,200 $2, an ounce. In my mind, there's going to be a transition where platinum is replaced, sorry, palladium is replaced with platinum, and uh, platinum prices should go back up uh, to around $2,000 an ounce in the longer term. Um, and and we, we certainly don't use that in our planning, but that is my expectations. We're more conservative in our planning. Hmm. Neil, thank you so much for joining us. Neil Fronman there, Sabanye Stillwater Chief Executive. Now coming up, a new era in human spaceflight. More on SpaceX's successful launch next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lives in New York with Francine Lacqua and Matt Miller in London. Well, I know Francine and Matt were very jealous yesterday when SpaceX successfully launched four civilians on a three-day voyage circling the Earth. Now, the flight dubbed Inspiration4 is a milestone for the company. Our correspondent Ed Ludlow was at the Kennedy Space Center for the launch. For SpaceX and the Inspiration4 crew, this was a success from launch right until the moment that the Dragon capsule carrying them separated from the second stage booster and continued on its journey deeper into space. The crew have now reached a cruising circular orbit of 585 kilometers above the Earth. That is a record for SpaceX's Dragon capsule and spacecraft, and they will spend three days orbiting the Earth, conducting some scientific experiments, including looking at human physiology and human biology. Biology. Uh, one of the crew members, Chris Ambrosky, says he wants to play a ukulele while he's up there. NASA officials told me, actually, that SpaceX has agreed to share all of the data from this mission with NASA for free. They'll be gathering information like radiation levels at that distance from the Earth. What kind of space debris is out there? And on a successful return back to the coast of Florida for the capsule, NASA engineers will be able to inspect the heat shield on the underside of the Dragon capsule to, to basically see how it fared in an orbit at that distance. In fact, the Inspiration4 crew will spend the most consecutive amount of time so far in a Dragon capsule. Of course, SpaceX has ferried NASA and other space agency astronauts to and from the International Space Station, but that's a 24-hour journey where they can get out on the other side. This all-civilian crew will spend three days. SpaceX say that this is a supply constrained business. They say they have a backlog and a list of willing paying customers who want to replicate this experience, but they have to do one successful attempt first. Remember, Jared Isaacman, the CEO of fintech company Shift4 Payments, is funding this whole expedition. He's the mission commander, but also its benefactor to the tune of a reported $200 million. The other members of the crew include Haley Arsenault, who survived cancer as a child and went on to be a physician's assistant at St. Jude, who are one of the other beneficiaries of this mission. The, the mission hopes to aim, hopes to raise $200 million for, for St. Jude as a part of the profile of space that this mission is giving. Uh, in another example, Dr. Siam Proctor almost became an astronaut in 2009 through the NASA selection process, but she was not successful. And this has given her another avenue in order to get to space. But the plan right now is for them to orbit for three days and hopefully touch down off the coast of Florida sometime between Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning. Ed Ludlow, Bloomberg News in Cape Canaveral, Florida.
I mean, imagine that. You go to space, and what you really, really want to do is just play a ukulele. Tom Keen, our co-anchor <laughs> of Bloomberg Surveillance. I, don't, I mean, you'd probably, you know, learn Italian in space, right? Do Tom something does useful. play ukulele. Yeah, well, not could, in space. I thought that was a superb report by Ed Ludlow. We do have to translate for uh, Mr. Ludlow. <laughs> 585 kilometers is 364 miles, and that's a big deal. That's where the Hubble spacecraft orbits, among other things. But the symbolism here, Francine, Matt, and Kaylee, is just exceptional. There's no other way to put it. I think this trip has been way, way underplayed. Bezos is a celebrity. Branson is a Agreed. celebrity. Baloney. Mm -hmm. This is factors a bigger deal than what Bezos and Branson did. Let's Agreed, go to the yeah. chart uh, quickly here. I'll be quick on this. Guys, Standard & Poor's 500. Let's take it from the orbit of John Glenn. When I faked, I was sick so I could stay home in 1962, the end of the Apollo mission, and up we from go. the great state the of Ohio. Yeah, the last space shuttle uh, mission, and the gentleman from Ohio spanned over to today. It's a stunning linear function of capitalism. All right, Tom. Uh, I, I want to point out also Neil Armstrong from Ohio. Imagine that one state in the United States of America could create so Here much innovation go. and so many presidents. I think eight presidents are from Ohio as well. One so. thing I've learned, OH? I-O. There you go. Nice job. <laughs> nice job. Yeah, Tom doesn't know what to say. Tom's lost for words. He's from Rochester. I, I think that Ohio's heritage is the fabulous state schools, the heritage of engineering, but as Matt Miller knows, it goes right back to the Wright brothers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In Dayton. And I mean, uh, Sloan Kettering uh, has roots there as well. So it's in so across so I, many industries. What is this, the Chamber Buckeyes. of Commerce for Ohio in London? Is that what this is this morning? We're learning. I know. <laughs> Watch out, Miller. From Ohio. He's going to force you to watch team. Buckeye football. That's what he's going to do. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's on State the cards. University. Tom, thanks so much sure. for joining us. Tom Keen there, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Let's get to what we're watching today. And uh, Kaylee, you're watching U.S. retail sales. We just talked to Stacey Vidlitz. What are you yep. expecting? 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Economists are expecting a seven-tenths of a percent decline on a month-on-month -month basis. But guys, a lot of that is going to have to do with autos. When you back out autos and gas, we're expecting it to actually be flat. But obviously, we could still be looking at the third drop in retail sales in four months which points to a pullback in consumer spending. How much can we blame the Delta variant for it? And what signal could that send about the trajectory of the U.S. economy in the third quarter, Matt? All right, I'll definitely be watching for that data point as well. I saw a story cross, though, this morning. Australia wants to buy nuclear subs, or late last night, um, nuclear subs from the U.S. and the U.K. And this is a huge deal, not just because of the size of the contract or of the military might that it's going to help Australia create. But because, you know, as Francine was talking about earlier, Angela Merkel is going to meet um, mm -hmm. Macron today. And they're going to be talking, at least for a little bit, about building up the European military might. They can no longer rely as much on the U.S. and now, of course, on the U.K. and um, Australia joining that alliance. The, the European powers are going to yeah. have to build their own yeah. military. But it's also funny because the French are furious. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's funny. I mean, I'm married to a Frenchman, so there's nothing that makes <laughs> it me laugh. It amuses you when the French the are angry. The French are, but basically, the French are really furious, especially at Joe Biden, because they cut out France and Europe from this deal. So you kind of left with your hands in your pockets saying, right, what happens next for Europe? Now, more Bloomberg surveillance coming up ahead. They'll be speaking to Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo of Johns Hopkins on vaccines. This is Bloomberg.